So being done with chapter two, I'm gonna go take a look at the quizzes. I don't think the quiz is open yet. Oh, it actually is. Let's set a good date for the chapter two review to be done. Let's set it to be due by next week. And let's give everybody infinite number of tries so that you can take the quiz as many times as you want. And I'm gonna walk y'all through the first one. All right, so you should be able to get to the quiz. Just click on the quizzes link. I'll also put it right now in the week two folder. Make it easy to spot. All right, so in week two, I can click on the quiz. I'm gonna preview it since I can't really take it. I guess I could switch into student mode and take it myself and see if I can do that. So modules, week two. quiz. Let's go see what we learned. This is an open book. It's just saying don't use Visual Studio or whatever. If it asks you to code something, code it yourself. If it asks you for the output, figure it out yourself. And of course, we agree to these rules. So which of the following are legal variable names? Well, our rules of thumb are that the only symbols that are allowed are letters, digits, and underscores. I didn't try to trip you up by throwing any dollar signs in there, which we found out, you know, sometimes work, but anyways. And it cannot begin with a digit. So this is definitely not a legal variable name. Let me zoom in a little. All right, that's not gonna work because it begins with a digit. We can rule that out. This one looks good, in my opinion. Certainly that one looks good. This has got a space in it. A space in it would break it up into two keywords, two so-called tokens. So that's not gonna work. A percent sign makes it an invalid variable. Only underscores and space, uh, only underscores and letters and digits. So that's bad. This one's good. That ought to get us going on that one. How many operands does a binary operator require? Well, what's a binary operator? Let's open the notepad up. Got too much going on over here. All right, there we go. So a binary operator is merely something that takes two operands. It doesn't mean zeros and ones like the other time we were talking about binary. It means it takes two operands. Well, what are operands? One plus two plus is the operator. One and two are the operands. So there we go. That's a binary operator because it took two operands. Here's another one. Right? That is the operator. One and two are, excuse me, C out and one are the operands and so forth. How about the equal sign? X equals three. Equal is the operator. X and three are operands. How about X equals three plus four? Well, that looks like it's got more than two operands. No, it really doesn't. And the, the thing is, is it's got more than two operators, which are making it look more complicated. But what happens? Everything on the left-hand side is done first. So for the plus operator, the operands are three and four. Once that is all collapsed down and you get an answer, which is seven, then it can be copied into the X. 
So seven is the operator or the result of the add, the result of the expression is the is one operator. So x and the result of the expression are the operators. And of course, plus is the operator and x and the result of the expression are the operands. I'll fix that. Thank you very much, Anna. Definitely that's not correct. And whenever there's a mistake in the due date, I go ahead and just set it for a week from the day that you tell me. Because that way, you know, if it's been a week and suddenly it shows up as being overdue because I, you know, set it back to last Monday's date, that's not very fair. Okay. So, you know, one more example. I don't want to belabor this point. I just want us to learn how to think the way the compiler does when it's looking at these problems. X equals, you know, three plus two, you know, times the POW one comma four. This has got a couple operators. It's got three operators. It's got that one, that one, and that one. And so doing parentheses first, we would solve that one. That's the operator and those are the operands. That would be five. And then that's another operator. And so it would be the result of that expression and the result of that expression. So it would need to call the POW function and figure it out. And one to the power of anything is just one. So then it's five times one, because now we can do that operator since these things have been evaluated. And that's five and that's one and it stores the five times one at X. And I'm gonna delete that, I don't feel like typing all that in. All right, so back to the quiz. How many operands does a binary operator require? Two. Suppose you have the following declarations. A equals zero, B equals zero, C is equal to zero. Write an assignment that does the following. Store the value 10 in C. Now, since the variable is already declared, we don't have to declare it ourselves. So you don't have to guess whether you're supposed to type, you know, enter double or whatever, it's already declared. So I'm gonna say C is equal to 10. Please leave out all spaces to help the auto grader. Don't forget to add the semicolon. All right, looks like I did that. Now what happens if you put in spaces after all? The auto grader is gonna count it wrong. No problem, I grade all these things by hand anyways, but the first time you take the quiz, or I mean, when you take the quiz, it's gonna give you a grade like 50% or 70% or something like that, because all of the fill in the blanks have to be graded by hand. And the auto grader will mark some of them wrong and it'll mark some of the others just to be graded and you won't get credit for those either. Your grade will go up as soon as they're graded. If you're ever itching to find out what your grade is, just text me, you know, and uh, if I can, I'll drop what I'm doing and go grade your quiz right away. So that ought to do it. And by the way, when I say don't, or please leave out all spaces to help the auto grader, I might say, please leave out all unnecessary spaces. And um, I can't remember why I think I need to do that. Oh yeah, like int main. This is a necessary space, right? That would be wrong. The auto grader would count it wrong. I would go in and I would eventually give you credit for it, right? Anyways, C is equal to 10. Remember that the right-hand side gets evaluated first and then it gets copied into the left-hand side when you use the assignment operator and you can't do the reverse. You can't say, hey, come back here. You can't say 10 is equal to C, right? That's incorrect syntax. The rules are that the right-hand side gets evaluated first and then put into the left-hand side. And C cannot overwrite the contents of 10, right? 10 is a literal, it's a fixed number. Assume you have the following declarations, A plus 10 into B. All righty. Now, if you wanted to get all fancy, you could come up with some other solution than this, but I'm gonna give you the simple one, right? B is equal to A plus 10 right? 
no spaces, put in the semicolon, we ought to be good to go. All right, assuming you have the following declarations, multiply 3.14 times B times B and store into C. And again, there's all sorts of ways you could write that, right? That's why I have to grade these things by hand. Okay, I'm gonna show you the most annoying way that you could write it. C is equal to B semicolon, B times equal B semicolon, B times equal 3.14 semicolon. Yeah, that actually does the trick. Oh, why would you do that? You would just take C is equal to 3.14 times, now if you wanna use the POW function, you can do that, or if you just want to say B times B, that's that's totally great. I would not count you wrong for the B POW function, the auto greater might, in which case won't give you credit. Don't sweat it. I'll come back in and give you credit. I don't know why it zoomed like that. Come back. All right. Assume you have the following decorator. Character C. Write an assignment that stores the character K into C. I'm gonna give you the wrong answer. That's wrong. Why is it wrong? Because I actually meant for those quotes to be part of the answer, right? I mean, normally quotes are just, you know, used to highlight something part, you know, but anyways, they're very important to the syntax. If it is a character, characters are always surrounded by single quotes in this language. Strings are surrounded by multiple quotes. So if this was your answer, that would be wrong. Even though it's a single letter long, it's still a string because a double quote made it so. And a string is a series of characters. It can be zero characters long, right? That's called the empty string. Or it can be a whole bunch of characters. But it's not a, char it's not a string, it's a single character, which means we have a single quote and exactly one thing between the single quotes. Question A, write an assignment that does the following. Subtract one from B and store the result in B. All right. Subtract one from B and store the result in B. Lots of ways you could do that. Here's one way, B equals B minus one. That subtracts one from B and stores the result in a B or just simply B minus minus. That works or even minus, minus B, that also works. Any of those three answers will be good. I'm kind of fond of this middle one here. I like the way it looks. C++, I'm gonna use B minus minus. They all do the same thing. Now B minus minus and minus minus B do something a little bit different, but the result is the same. Let me tell you what the little bit different is. If I have this expression, Come back. If I have this expression, B equals three, and then C equals B minus minus, what does that mean? If the minus minus is a suffix, it means it's the last thing that happens. If we went and we looked up that table, operator precedence, C++ operator precedence. We will see that if the plus plus is the postfix, it happens after some stuff. It's down here somewhere. Well, now I can't find it. Where is it? Am I missing it? Well, anyways, plus plus ahead of the variable gets done very early in the priority, right? It gets done before additions and subtractions and assignments. All right, now I can't explain what I'm about to tell you based on the fact that it's saying plus plus following it is even higher than, than that. So ignore that, I cannot reconcile it. I know that what I'm about to tell you is correct, even if I can't point to the table and tell you why. In this case, minus minus is the last thing that happens. 
So three gets copied into C. So after this is done, C is three, and then B gets reduced by one. B is two. So after that, C gets to be three because the B gets copied into C first. And since the B minus minus follows a variable, it's the very last thing that happens. Now, what if you did uh, X is equal to three and Y equals minus minus X? The minus minus precedes it, right? It's a prefix. So it's the very first thing that happens. So X will drop down from three to two and then x gets copied into y, right? And so y is also equal to two. But if you had the line on its own, right? x plus plus or x minus minus or whatever, you know, all by its lonesome, it's gonna wind up being the same regardless of whether uh, the minus minus happens before the semicolon or after, right? If I said x equal to 10 and I do x minus minus, it's gonna be nine, yeah? If x is equal to 10 and then the minus minus preceded it, same difference. I love that phrase, I don't know what it means. You know, still gonna be nine. So for our quiz question. Any one of those things would work. B minus minus, minus minus B, or B equals B minus one, right? B equals B minus one. Subtract one from B and store the result in B. Which keyword or escape sequence causes printing to go to a new line? Well, backslash in or STD ENDL. They both work. So both of the work options work. Using the following declarations, F name is Bob, L name is Roberts, write a line of code that will print my name is Bob Roberts. Now, some people do this, and it always annoys me inordinately. No, it said using the following variable declarations. So I'm supposed to use these variables. All right, now what's the trick? The trick is that I need to put the space between them. So here's what I can't do. C out less than less than quote, my name is less than less than F name, less than less than L name, less than less than EMBL. Looks great, right? But when it runs, it's gonna print out my name is Bob Roberts with no space between them. So we gotta modify a little bit. We gotta put that space between the F name and the L name. So it's gonna be F name, arrow, arrow, quote, space, quote, arrow, arrow, L name. Error, error, E and DL. That makes sense? You just got to get that space there. All right, question 11. What two character symbol begins a single line comment? Well, we've been using comments since day one, slash, slash is a single line comment. What symbol begins a preprocessor directive? It's the top thing in all of our programs. Pound sign. Some people type pound sign include. No, this doesn't begin the preprocessor directive because there's more than one kind of preprocessor directives. There's also define, for example, and we'll see others. It's just the pound sign, the shift three that marks it as a preprocessor directive. What symbol represents modulus? That. What will the above code print? All righty. It's asking for X, so I'm only going to solve X. I'm going to ignore the other ones. So five plus three, and then print it out. Oh, that one's easy. Five plus three is eight. Some people will get fancy and type in X is equal to eight. The auto grader is gonna count it wrong. I'll give you credit for it, but it's not strictly correct because that's not what it's gonna print. All right, next, what is Y? All right, A divided by B. They are both integers. If they are both integers, the result is going to be an integer, meaning it's going to divide and round down. 
Well, five divided by three is 1.6667, but the result is an integer, so it gets rounded down. 1.667 rounded down is just one. We can guess what the next question is gonna be. It's gonna be, what is Z? All right, so A modulus B. When B goes into A, the quotient is one. We just found that out, but how many were left over? Three goes into five one time with a remainder of two. So that's the answer to the next question. I mean, I guess I could, you know, on an official test, be changing those numbers each time to make you think harder, but I think the real point is just to make sure you understand the concept. So. B goes into A one time, that's a quotient, with a remainder of two, because five minus three is two. I think there's 20 questions, so we're almost done. What keyword is used to mark a variable as a constant? Now, if you've taken Java, you're gonna be tempted to type, nope, 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 that's not right, it's const. What data type would be most appropriate for a counter that counts from one to 10, all whole numbers? Bool's not gonna work because it's only got trues or falses. Strings aren't good for counting because they have quotes around them and you'd have to do some nasty conversion to get them to actually iterate. Double, well, they're whole numbers. Let's go with int. Question 19, which data would be the most appropriate to hold a series of characters? String. And which data type would be most appropriate to hold a floating point number? An int is a whole number, strings got quotes around it, so it's gonna be a double. 21, oh, I thought we were stopping at 20. And what can hold true or false? We know that one. If it can hold true or false, it's a bool. Strictly speaking, you could probably store it in an int as well, but the most appropriate is to store it in the variable designed for true and false. Okay, I don't remember talking about this. I don't remember a page in the PowerPoint talking about it. So we've got to talk about it now. Maybe I'll even make a note to the effect of the right answer, but all right. This is called a ternary operator. We have unary operators, uno meaning one. We have binary operators and we have ternary. Okay, don't know why they're not trinary. It has three parts, and it's easier to read if I separate it by parentheses. But it's like this, x, y, colon, z. If x is true, the result of the expression is y. If x is false, the result, false, the result of the expression is z. So what if you had this code? X is false, Y is one, Z is two, and you had the problem, C out, X question mark, Y colon Z. What is it gonna print? It's gonna look at X. Is X true or false? If it was true, it would return the thing after the question mark, but it's false, so it's gonna return the thing after Z. Normally you don't just have a single variable there, normally you have an expression. Like if temperature is 30, then C out, the expression might be temp less than 32, parentheses colon, quote, freezing, end quote. Whoops, that was supposed to be a question mark. That's the order of them. The question mark comes first and then the colon comes. Not freezing. So what's it gonna print? Well, is the temperature less than 32? By the way, the parentheses are not necessary. We could take out all the spaces. It just made it easier in my mind for you to see and understand. So I do like to have the parentheses there and for some reason I didn't in the quiz, normally I do. All right, so anyways, is temperature less than 32? It sure is. So it's gonna print out freezing.
All right, let's go look at what we really have. That's our expression. What's the quiz question exactly? If the user enters 10 and X is zero. So X is going to be 10 by the time we're done, then what will Y be? All right, X is less than zero. If X is 10, is X less than zero? No, negatory. If this was true, it would return negative one, but it's false. So it's going to grab that one and copy it into Y. So that would be what Y equaled. Negative one. Hope that makes sense. And we should see more examples of that as we go along. What can store a larger number, an int or a float? Well, a float supports exponents. The largest an int can store is about 2 billion or 4 billion if you make it an unsigned int. But anyway, that's only got nine zeros. A float can hold up to like 38 zeros, you know, 10 to the power of 38. So a float can be much larger. Any floating point number is going to be larger than the than the uh, integer type. So it doesn't matter if it's a long, long and a float or a double and an int or whatever. Which data type is limited to 2 billion or less? That's an int. And what would you use to hold a floating point number larger than 1e e to the 37? If it's a huge number, you it's supposed to be a decimal, excuse me, it's supposed to be a floating point type because it's in scientific notation. So that would make it a double. And I think that's the last one. All righty. Even though it doesn't give me a grade, I'm going to click submit. I wonder if it does. I wonder if I can go back and review my results. I'm going to click attempt one and see what it tells me. It told me I missed two. Let's go see why. If I got one out of one, I know I got it correct. So I'm going to skip that one. I'm going to skip that one. That one's that one out of one. That one's one out of one. That one's one out of one. That one's one out of one. All righty, one out of one. Tedious. I'm just going to start. I'm going to stop saying that and just keep going until I find one that's not. There we go. All right, this is one that has to be graded by hand. It's a fill in the blank. It gives me some correct answers. And I guess, I don't know why it didn't accept it, but I would grade it by hand. I think I put too many spaces in it. Yeah, so anyways, you would eventually get credit for it. Just remember that. If it's fill in the blank and it counts it wrong, it has to be graded by hand. You will probably get you know full credit for it if it's any form of correct. The next one's probably like that too. I mean, I could have gotten it wrong, but let's go look. Oh, I got them backwards, right? The negative one was first and the positive one was second. I don't know what I was thinking. So if X is 10, is 10 less than zero? No, it is not. If it had been, it would return negative one. It is, so it returns positive one. How do I? Yeah, I just totally flaked on that one. Right? Should have been positive one. X less than zero is false, so the result is one, not negative one. All right, that's the second one I missed. That means that I got 24 out of 25. I might accept that or I might take it again, you know. It's up to you. You could conceivably get 100 on every quiz. Now you only get one shot at the exam. For some reason, somebody thought that they could take the midterm over and over. And I'd certainly never said that, but maybe I hadn't explicitly said that was not the case. No, under most circumstances, I'm not going to let people t t take the exams multiple times. 
it'd have to be extraordinarily weird circumstances like a brand new outbreak of COVID that completely disrupted our school system again. That was a once in a lifetime thing, I hope. Anyways, all right. So I don't know if you took it while I was taking it. Great if you did. If you did take it while I was taking it, you might want to take it again. Just test your own knowledge. Wait a couple of days, take it again, right? Make sure that you do just as good that time as you did this time. All right, cool. Jung's here, so we got another student. Excellent. Exit student view mode. All righty. Anything else to do for chapter two? I do not believe so. So one thing I'm gonna do is somebody had a question about how to make their output look right on the uh, one of the conversion homeworks because they had it working, but they didn't like the results. I'm gonna to try to make a perfect looking result. Sorry, I was messing around with C-sharp, so it wound up looking a little bit different there for a minute. All right, so make a new project. We're on lecture D. It's a C++ project. It's a Windows project. It's a desktop console application. So that makes it a console app. Let's get it going. All righty. So if I have F is equal to MA, I seem to recall that being an equation from physics. which means that the force acting on an object is equal to the mass times its acceleration. Nah, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna do one of those simple conversion problems. Not necessarily one from the uh, homework. Yeah, why not? Who cares? Let's uh, go in and I wanna do a conversion from Fahrenheit to Celsius. So, um, Celsius to Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit to Celsius. Okay, so I would add the using namespace, of course, using namespace STD. Let's ask them the question How many degrees F? Question mark. There may be a couple of spaces to let them type and then a little greater than sign to tell them exactly where to type. We're going to need a variable to hold our result. So I'm going to declare two variables. I'd like for them to be doubles so that they can type in decimal points. You know, um, you know. so let's, did, variables could be called temp underscore F and temp underscore C, right? Okay. Let's let them type it in. CIN greater than, greater than, temp underscore F. We ask the question, we get the answer. That's called a prompt. So I'm gonna add a comment. Prompt the user for input. Now it could be that we need to ask them a lot of questions, but this equation only takes one input. So let's do our conversion. Temp underscore C is equal to temp underscore F minus 32, I just happen to have this memorized, divided by 1.8. That's the formula. All right, here's what I would like my output to look like. I would like it to say, you know, 212 degrees F equals 100 
degrees C. That's what I'm going for, right? Give them the most information as possible. Why do you need to type in, out 212? They know that they type that. Well, that's true, but when I type in my address into Amazon, I also like to see before I actually click that OK button to make sure that it's using the right address. That's called echoing your input. Echoing your input lets the user see part of what they typed in along with the answer so that they can validate it visually. Because you know, if it said 1000 degrees C and I saw 212 there, I could go, oh, I don't understand. But if I saw this and then 1000, I go, oh, I made a typo when typing this number in. Now that's not the right conversion, right? But anyways. So how are we gonna make it look like that? Let's consider our C out statements carefully. C out less than less than. To fill that in, we need temperature F. So C out less than less than temperature underscore F, less than less than. Now we need this part, degrees F equals from there to there. Well, you know what? I'm just gonna copy that and paste it here, right? temp underscore F less than less than quote space degrees F equals space. Why the spaces? So that it doesn't look like that, right? And that, I don't want that. So I put the spaces at the beginning and the end of the string. And now just because I'm running out of space on my screen, but you know, you have a smaller font set, so you won't, I'm going to the next line, less than less than, and I wanted to print out that number. Well, that's stored in temp underscore C. And then the rest of the string is that part. So again, I'm just gonna copy that. Quote, space, quote, right? Backslash N or ENDL, either one works. All right, I'm gonna try it out, out of work. Let's let it go. All right, how many degrees F? 212. 212 degrees F equals 100 degrees C. All right, looks good to me. So, you don't have to go back and revise your homework, but you know, that's how you would do it. Um, one student had forgotten what ENDL meant, and so their output was starting to look pretty strange because, you know, multiple things were on the same line. And somebody else wasn't putting this part in, and so it wasn't telling them, you know, it would say degrees F equals something degrees C, but it didn't have all of it. And some students like to make it to where it asks a question and then does the choice that they want. For example, we could ask, what kind of conversion we want to do. This is called a menu-driven program. You don't have to be doing this, but if you wanted to, you could do this. You could declare a variable, like called choice, or you can make it a string even, right? And we could ask them, what do you want to do? C out, one for F to C, two for C, to F, three, four, whatever, right? You know, I don't remember all the choices. C to K, right? If we were gonna do Kelvin. Okay, so that's our menu. We can make the menu look however we want. Maybe give them a greater than sign to tell them where to type. Okay, and then I read in their choice like that, C-I-N, greater than, greater than, end of the choice. Why am I getting an error here? It's just the usual thing that the error go away if I save it. Doesn't seem to be. Anyways, I'm gonna go on, yeah, fine. Okay, and then I would set up some if statements. If choice equals equals quote one, then they wanted F to C. So I would put a curly brace there, and I got to get rid of that closed curly brace, right? And then I would need to shift all this over. 
Now you could shift them one by one. I mean, you could tab them one by one. You can also highlight an entire block and then hit the tab key and it'll move them all over. Okay, so I've handled choice number one. How about choice number two? Else if parentheses choice equals equals quote two. Notice that in this language, it's else if. In Python, it was just elif. I always thought that was kind of weird because I, every other language I've used, if it had an else, it was else space if. All right, now I'm not gonna do this one, right? I'm not gonna add the uh, conversion here, so I'm just gonna see out, not implemented yet, backslash in. Now, when you ever you have a series of if else's, we also had a choice for three, right? So I better do that one. I'm just gonna copy the whole thing here and make it say else if choice equals three, not implemented yet. And then I'm gonna put a final else here to handle if they typed in anything else other than one, two, and three, because that's useful information. We could say C out less than less than choice less than less than quote is not a valid choice just to let them know, right? So now when we run it, they get those choices. And if they type in one, two, or three, they get those messages. Right? And so if I type in one, how many degrees F? Zero. Well, that's negative 17 degrees C. Sounds good to me. I'm gonna try them all out. During your testing, you should try all the options that are presented in your menus. Two, all right, not implemented yet, no surprise. Three, not implemented yet. And what's gonna happen if I choose one of those choices, but I don't choose any of them, like four. It says not a valid choice, and that's true. We could make it loop until they give us a valid choice. Yeah, that's getting way ahead of ourselves. We're not even supposedly really in if statements, but y'all know what if statements are, and if not, you've already got the idea just from seeing this example. So this is an example of a menu-driven. Offer them a, a list of choices and didn't do that. Now, if I give you something like this where you're supposed to perform three tasks, I don't mind if you don't do it this way, right? It's easier to test if uh, I don't have to run the program three times in a row, right? If I can just type in all the input at once and it gives me three results. But there'll be times when I will ask you to set it up as a menu. And some people like to set it up like that. Some people want to put all of their homework in one super mega program. And I don't really recommend that, but you could. You could have a menu choice that said, you know, run homework one, another, you know, or homework two or homework three. It would look the same. It's just that your program, your CPP file is going to become huge, putting all your homework in it. I don't recommend that. All right. We are into chapter three, unless anybody has questions. Yes, absolutely. You can use switch. Somebody knows the C or Java language, Anna. You could use the switch statement. What is the switch statement? Switch statement looks like this. Switch based on that variable. And what it is, is when we say switch, it's like one of those railroad switching yards you saw on Thomas the Tank Engine, right? Which way is the train going to go? Is it going to go down route A, you know, route one, route two, or route three? So if ABC is a one, I'm gonna do something. Let's make this a grade. And so if it's a 10 or a nine, they made an A, right? So case 10, C out, less than, less than, quote, A, end quote, semicolon, break. What if they make a nine? That's also an A. C out less than less than a semicolon break. What if it's a eight? C out less than, whoopsie, case eight colon 
C out less than less than B. Because an eight is a B and a seven is a C. Now, a lot of folks, me including me, usually put the break statement on their own line. I'm just trying to conserve a little bit of space to get this all on the screen at the same time. Okay, I changed the name of this variable without changing the name of this variable. That was a mistake. Okay, so they either made a 10, a 9, or an 8. I'm just going to copy this to make it a 7. That's a 7. If they earned a 7, they get a C. We're going to do a D now. So I'm going to paste once more. That's a 6. They earned a D. And I've always wondered why you can't make a grade of an E. But anything below a D is an F. Well, I'm not going to put a case 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, or 0. That would be too much. I can just do this. This is like that final else up here. Right? We had a final else here that was not a valid choice. The default does the same thing. If nothing else happens, then the default triggers. Not a valid grade. Like that. And if it's a default, it's the last thing in the list. You don't have to put a break, but it's not a syntax error to put it. Now, what does the break do, really? Why do you have to have it? If I didn't have this break here, then if their grade was a nine, it would jump down to nine, it would print out A, and then it would do what's known as fall through and also print out B. We don't want it to print out that they had an A and a B. If there weren't any break statements at all, then if they earned a nine, it would print A, and then it would fall through to print out a B, and let's pretend that's not there, and then it would print a C, and then it would print a D. Not good. So you need the break statements. Are there times when you might write switch statements without break statements? Yeah, but it's few and far between. When we actually talk about break statements, I mean switch statements, I may come up with an example because I've got one in mind of when you might actually prefer to do that. I have these redundant choices here, right? Both 10 and nine produce an A. I could edit this so that I said either case 10 or case nine print out A, and that lets me delete this entire case. So there we go. We could have implemented this as a switch, right? Case on choice. If I had done that, I'd better not make choice a string. Some languages let you do switch on strings. C++ does not. It has to be an integer or character type. Character would have worked. But what I would have done if I'd wanted to do switches is make that an int and then remove the quotes, right? Now, I'm not going to rewrite it that way, but you could. So I just undid those changes. All right, why don't we take a short break? How's about I upload where we are right now, our notes of anybody who wants it. I'm going to paste these notes into the other one. So I'll post this into the chat in just a second. And upload it to y'all and we can take a five minute break. All right, the file is in the chat if you want to go get it. All right, let's come back at about 8.20. See you soon. All right. I don't mind going back and doing examples like that again. For one thing, we always expand upon our knowledge, like we hadn't talked about setting up menu-based. And then with Anna's suggestion of talking about switch, we learned even more.
we will hit that again in a later chapter, but now you already know it. So next time you see it, you'll, you know, hammer it in. You'll know it absolutely for certain. Let's go to chapter three. Oh, and by the way, we have a link for the lectures. So if I ever forget to put a link inside the notes itself, like you go to the notes and the notes is empty or it says video colon, but it's blank, you can usually find it here. If that's the case, why don't you go ahead and send me a text message anyway saying that it's gone, but you don't have to wait for me to fix that, right? You can just go in and, and into our playlist and find it there. Expressions and interactivity. This is the kind of chapter where we could scroll through it and get done with it in 15 minutes. Well, I'm kidding, but we've already seen an awful lot of this stuff. Like we've been using the CIN object. The CIN object it requires the IO stream. So you pound sign include IO stream. What does it do? It reads input from the keyboard. Information is retrieved using this stream insertion operator. That's also a binary operator because it takes CIN on one side and a variable on the other. And input is stored in one or more variables. What does that mean? You can use it to store two variables rather than just one, like this. Let's declare two variables, string F name, comma, L name. And let's ask them, Please type in your first and last name, space, space, greater than, end quote, semicolon. And then CIN, F name, arrow, arrow, L name. And so what happens, whatever we type in, and better have a space between it, that's normally how we think of first and last names anyways, there better be exactly two pieces of data, that's what it's asking for, and then what C++ does is it so calls tokenizes the input tokenizes means that it uses it breaks up the input based on spaces and tabs and character turns so if i type in jeff thompson as the input it's going to go okay find something to store an f name what am i going to find well it's going to be the first chunk of characters up through a space tab or character turn well that happens to be that right because there's a space there and then it's go, gonna go, oh, well, I also need something for L name. So then it's gonna say, find the next chunk and store it there. Now, what if I typed in three things? John Quincy Adams. What's it gonna do? It's gonna store that into F name. And it doesn't matter if that's a space or a tab or a character turn. It's gonna skip ahead to the next non-blank character and so store that string in an L name, and it's gonna leave this waiting for the third piece of input. So let's play with this a little bit more, and then it's gonna get annoying to have to type in all this stuff each time. So we're probably going to uh, comment this out. But anyway, see out, what state do you live in? Space, space, greater than, end quote, semicolon. And then CIN into state. Now I don't have a state variable, so I better go up and add one, right? F name, comma, L name, comma, state. All right. So when I run it, I'm going to go ahead and run it now. going to ask me for Fahrenheit. I'm just going to choose something that doesn't ask me for any more input, not implemented yet. Please type in a printout A. Why? Because of that big switch block. 
please type in your first and last name. All righty. John Adams. What state do you live in? Well, I happen to live in Oklahoma. All right, great. I'm going to run it again. I wish this would stay where I wanted it to go. The toolbar is wandering around and on me again. All right, guess there's nothing I can do about it. I'm gonna do choice two, whatever, not implemented yet. Please type in your first and last name. John Quincy Adams. What state do you live in? Notice it went right past it. If we printed out the first and the middle and the last name, or the first and last name and then the state, let's add that. So C out, space, space, F name equals end quote, space, space, F name, space, space, NDL. I'm tired of seeing that uh, A from up here, right? Appear at the beginning of my input. So I'm gonna add a backslash N to each one of these. A backslash N, B backslash N, C backslash in, D backslash in, and not a valid grade backslash in. That looks good to me. Now, what was I doing? Oh yeah, print out the first name. I'm just gonna copy and paste that. Print out the last name. I'm gonna copy and paste that, make the modifications and print out the state. I'm gonna copy and paste that, make the modifications, there we go. All right, let's run it one more time. Please type in your first and last name. John Quincy Adams. My first name is John. My last name is Quincy, and the state is Adams. It's not really what I wanted, right? But it's what we got because we typed in John Quincy Adams. John went there, Quincy went there, and Adams went there. It didn't even wait for them to type in anything. There was something left in the, in the buffer, left in the input stream to read, and so it read it. So I don't really recommend that we do this too often, where we ask for two pieces of input. Why? Because they get confused if they only enter one piece of data. Like this. If I run it. And then it says type in your first and last name. And I forgot to put a space, right? It just sits there. It's waiting for me to type in another token. I don't know what to do to get it to work. And finally I type to heck with it. And then it starts working again, right? And there we go. So using that double arrow thing is okay. It works. I wouldn't depend upon it too much, at least when reading from the user input. If I was reading from a file, sure. You know, I'm expecting the input, the file input to look a specific way. I might be able to depend on it, always having the two pieces of data. But not when I'm asking a user, because I don't want them to get in a state where they're hitting enter and nothing is happening. All right, I'm gonna comment out this stuff with the switch. I don't wanna see that anymore. So slash star, and then I'm gonna scroll down here. Or tell you what, I'm gonna just use the option, although it looks ugly. I'll fix it when I upload it into the notes. Highlight all that, go up to edit, advanced, comment out. Where is it? comment section. Here we go. It didn't do it. 
Oh, it did. It put a uh, slash star at the end of it and a star slash at the beginning. Cool. That's the way you do comments. All right. I might even do the same thing for this bit because I'm tired of having to type in something each time we run it. So I'm going to comment out this code too because it looks okay in the notes, right? So I'm going to highlight all of that and choose advanced edit, advanced comment out, comment selection. All right, good. And now all I have is this part. Well, this part's annoying too. I'm having to answer three questions. So lastly, I'm going to comment that out. All right. Okay. Now we can start fresh. We've seen examples already. I'm not going to look at that page. The CIN object converts data to the type that matches the variable. If you ask for an int, it does the conversion automatically. That's different than Java. When you take Java, you're going to see that you have to use a different input function to read an int as opposed to a string, as opposed to a floating point number. Displaying a prompt. A prompt is when you give them a question and you let them type in the answer. Well, we've been doing that for a while. You see what I mean by we can go through this chapter quickly? Now I'm kidding about it doing 15 minutes because of course I always find something else to talk about. But we know what a prompt is. Just ask a question, let them type in the answer. CIN can be used to input more than one value. We just demonstrated that with first name and last name. When they type in the data, the data has to be separated by spaces or tabs or carriage returns, usually spaces. Mathematical expressions. You can create complex expressions using multiple math symbols. And by the way, when we're calling these operators, these are not the only operators. These are operators as well, right? And there's even others, but uh, we're not gonna talk about them. But right for now, these are our arithmetic operators though, our math operators. And the expression could be combinations of literals or variables and constants and even function calls, right? So here's an example, um, all separated by mathematical symbols. This is an expression right here. This is an expression right here. Well, this part is an expression, right? It's built up of some sub expressions. There's a little bitty expression. And order of operations, the minus sign when it's just flipping a number to be negative is the first highest most thing, right? We don't think of that as being an operator. We think of that as being the number two, or excuse me, minus two. We think of that as being a single number. And that's okay for us to think, but the way the computer has to handle it is that is a symbol, right? It's not a digit. And so what it does is it sees that minus and it says, oh, I'm going to flip the value of the thing that follows to be negative. And so then it reads that two and it flips it to negative. That's called unary negation. Got to give it a fancy word. That's the unary negation operator. Bleh. I'm not going to say that very often because it's tiresome to say. Anyways, we usually think of that as just being a single number. But it has the highest order of operation. It's got the highest priority. And then multiplication, division, and modulus is second tier. And addition and subtraction is third tier. And I think I used the phrase PIMDAS. I know I did, right? Because parentheses are even higher than multiplication and division. And then there's multiplication and division is a second tier. And then there's addition and subtraction is third tier. So. This would be the thing that would be evaluated first, right? And it would turn that into negative two. And then 
but that's because I added that. Let's get rid of that so that their uh, example is as it was. And then, then since multiplication happens before addition, that would happen. It would multiply in its little brain two times two. So that's four. And then addition and subtraction would happen left to right, right? So it would find a plus sign and it would do that, add four to two, and then it would go on over here and it would subtract two from whatever that was. So order of operations, if we can scroll these answers off the side so that we don't already know them, there we go. What happens first? Well, multiplication always happens first. So it would multiply two times four. Two times four is eight. Add five to it, that's gonna be 13. Looking at this, what happens first? Well, multiplication and division always happen before add, subtract. So this would happen first. 10 divided by two is five minus three, five minus three is two. Here's a longer one, but we can figure it out. Multiplication division is always done first. 12 times two is 24. And then we go left to right. Eight plus 24 is 32. Minus four is 28. Hope I got that right. If, if I was uncertain, I would get a piece of notebook paper and write it down. Four plus 17 modulus two. Well, modulus counts as multiplication and division. It's in the same tier. So 17 modulus two, that means two goes into 17. What's the remainder? Well, it's an odd number. So two goes into 17 eh, eight times with a remainder of one. So this part is a one. Four plus one is five. Minus one is back to four. And lastly, three times two. I see a chat message just sec. Three times two is six. Six minus six is zero, plus seven is seven, minus one gets it back down to six. Okay, I don't quite understand the question, Anna. I'm sorry, what are character turns, symbols? I don't know if you can rephrase it or if you wanna jump in on voice. And yes, I did assign a due date for chapter two, you know, a week. So the, the operators are symbols, right? And then the literals are the, either the numbers or the things inside quotes. And I don't know if I've answered your question. Please feel free to rephrase it as, I, as we go on. You may be typing it right now. So parentheses can force the order of operations. What's gonna happen first here? Well, whatever's inside the parentheses. Two plus two is four. And then we would do the multiplication next. So four times two is eight. And then eight minus two is six. Here, the parentheses get done first. So two minus two is zero. Then we have the asterisks. So since this is zero, two times zero is zero. And then we can do the addition. It's almost happening in reverse order, right? But it's not reverse order, it's doing it by order of precedence. And then this zero, two gets added to it, so it's two. Lastly, two, we've got two sets of parentheses. We would do this one first, two plus two is four. Then we would do this one, two minus two is zero. And two plus, and so zero, excuse me, four times zero is zero. I hope that makes sense. Sometimes I give people a worksheet of these, but I'm just hoping that they make sense. I think I'm about done with these. Okay, you said when entering multiple data sets, they must be separated by spaces. Oh, very good question. I'm using a phrase that sounded like character turn. And I'm sorry I was not speaking very clearly. Carriage return old-fashioned term, right, for when you're typing on a typewriter. That's the input key or the return key or the new line. That's what I meant. So if my program does this, see out, enter name, or enter X, right? And then it lets them type in X, and then it says see out, enter Y, and then we let them type it into Y. 
and I don't have quotes everywhere that I need to to get that to work. Like that. Well, when it asks enter X, what it's gonna do is do that, enter X, and it's gonna sit there waiting for a response. And I could type in 10, and I could just hit enter. Right now, that's a carriage return, and it's done with the input. So the carriage return triggers that to be the end of the input, and so 10 will get stored into X. Or I could type in a space. Now, it's not gonna actually send that input to X until I do hit enter, so I could type in 20 as well. And then when I hit the carriage return, when I type in the slash in, well, no, I don't type that in, right? But I hit return on the keyboard, enter on the keyboard. Then it's gonna go, all righty, 10 goes into X, but it's gonna leave this sitting here waiting for the next input. And so when it says enter Y, it's gonna immediately store 20 into Y without letting them give it another shot, right? Hope that makes sense. Next time I'll need to type that out so that you know what I mean. The book must use a different term for that because that's kind of antiquated, right? That's when you're typing in an old fashioned typewriter. All right. All right, cool. We're done here. I'm not gonna type any more of these. Algebraic expressions. Multiplication does require an operator. You know how in uh, math books, you'll see phrases like F equals MA, E equals MC squared, like that. Well, we're not so lucky. If we have M is equal to 10 and C is equal to six to the power of 23, and we want to calculate E, we can't just type in E is equal to MC power of two, right? Instead, I have to say E equals M asterisk C, but then we, since we want to take it to the power of two, then we can do that, or we could use the POW function. Either way, there we have expressed this equation as a formula. The computer would think that MA was a separate variable, and it would throw up an error. So if we had M is equal to 10, and then we had A is equal to 20, and then we had F is equal to MA, it would say MA undefined. And we we'll keep doing that until we type that. So there's no implicit multiplication of terms. So whenever you Google a formula and it says area is equal to height times width, you have to go that. That makes it a, a, an expression. That makes it a programming expression. Would I need to put parentheses around it? It doesn't hurt. Absolutely does not hurt. The question is, do I need to put parentheses around the C times C? Absolutely nothing wrong with it. You can always use parentheses to make things more clear. For example, if I have X is equal to two plus three times four, you and I know that three times four happens first. But if we were showing this code to somebody else, the code would be, in it would be easier to read if I did that, right? Because everybody knows what that means. Well, I shouldn't say everybody, but most people know what that means. Go ahead and use parentheses as often as you'd like. It's not necessary though, because in this case, it's just all in order, right? And so it would multiply M times C and it would get that result and then it would multiply that by C again. So it would work just as well not. And if I was going to phrase it myself, I would prefer to do it like this, just so it looks a little bit better. I don't know if that makes it look better or not, but it does to me. So turn this formula or equation into an expression. Either one of these would be valid answers. Excellent question, Joe. So that means that if you have a phrase like this, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, if you try to write it like this, come on, 
if I tried to write it like this, m is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, that's not going to work at all. You probably know how you fix it. You put in parentheses because you need to force these things to be evaluated separately before the division is done. Now that'll work. The book doesn't call it that, but this is known as composition. Composition is the art of taking a written equation or written formula and converting it into an expression that the language supports. So 6b means 6 times b, so type in 6 asterisk b. 312 means 3 times 12, so you can type in 3 asterisk 12. 4xy means 4 times x times y, so type in 4 asterisk x asterisk y. When you mix apples with oranges, type conversion. Now, this is the point where it actually does start to get long, where we have to uh, go on for that supposed imaginary 15 minutes I said that this was going to take. Operations have to be performed between operands of the same type. Meaning, if you add two things together, they have to be of the same type. Or the program will crash? No, because the language handles some of it for you. If I have this expression, x is equal to 1 plus 2.0, I'm going to space it out like I normally do, then what does it do? How does it solve it? The compiler looks at it and says, are these the same type? No, they're not the same type. Now for the math circuitry and the computer to work, it's gonna have to have things of the same type because the computer can do integer math and it can also do floating point math. So it would take a look at this, the compiler would, and when it writes some machine code in order to handle it, it would write the code that would turn this into a floating point number to be added to that. Why did it turn that into a floating point? Well, because they need to be of the same type. And if you turn this into an int, that could be bad news, right? Because 2.1, could that be an int? No, it would lose something in the conversion to an int. It would just be two. So the lower precision type gets converted, upgraded, promoted to be of the more precision type. I don't know if I said that right. It's a hierarchy of types. Ints are more restricted. They hold smaller values than unsigned ints and unsigned longs. And all of these are of lesser quality than floats, which are of lesser quality than doubles. Now, our language does not use long doubles. I mean, you can. But at least on Microsoft C and on the Mac, I believe that they're the same size as a double. So I'm going to delete that. And we would not just say long because Microsoft uses long longs. And we really have been talking about unsigns. So I'm gonna delete that. This is the order of hierarchy that I really would like for you to remember. If you mix any of these types, the lesser one will be converted, promoted to the greater than, to the greater one. So if you multiply a double times a float, the compiler will combine, will offer code It'll put code into the machine language that converts the long to a double. Now, normally we don't really care. What do I mean by that? We just type the expression. That's why we have computers in programming languages, right? A is equal to X plus B, and we don't much care whether X and B are longs or floats or whatever, but do keep it in the back of your mind. So it's called type coercion. Type coercion is automatic conversion of an operand to another data type. If I type this, I need to close this text edit window. I don't. Do I have three files going on at the same time? Oh, no, that's. Hmm. I think all of that is in the notepad still. Yes, so I can close that. Good, because it was confusing me. All right, so if I have this, 
int a and then long b comma c and let's just put some values in them a is equal to one b is equal to two and c is equal to three and then let's make a double which is equal to four point oh so if i do this double x is equal to a plus b they're of different types the int gets promoted to be a long so that it can do the math. And then one plus two is three. No problem. But it's, I'm going to type in 3.0 because the result is a floating point. No, it's not. An int and a long are uh, integer types. So it would just be int L. Oh, and I should call this long, long. I hate that. All right. And so then it would be three, but then it's going to get stored in a double. So it has to be coerced again. The A had to be promoted to become a long so that this addition could happen. And then that integer result had to be promoted to a double. It had to be coerced to be stored as a double. And again, that's totally safe, right? As long as you're going up the hierarchy, you're not losing any data types, right? You can convert an int to a long and you can convert to a long to a double just fine because a long fits comfortably within a double by and large. However, there are times when you have demotion, when you're taking something from a higher type to a lower type, and that can give you data loss. What kind of data loss? What if I did this? Int y is equal to d times c. Well, d is a double, c is a long, so the compiler is going to provide code that turns C into a double first so that it can do the math. Now it's got two doubles. It's got 3.0 and 4.0. It multiplies those together and it gets 12.0. Great. But then look what it's getting stored into. And some languages won't even compile if you do that. Oh, you're trying to store a floating point into an integer? That's a syntax error. I'm not going to compile. This language will do it. This language will go ahead and copy 12 into y. Now, that's okay, really, in this particular case. But what if 4 had been a fraction like that? And so 3 times 4.5 would be 13.5, I think. And then 13.5, when stuffed into an int, it would lose the 0.5. And so the final answer would just be 13. We have lost some data by putting it into a less accurate data type, a more restrictive data type. So data demotion causes data loss, or at least it can. Some languages, like I said, won't compile. And so what you would have to do is in those languages, you would have to do what's known as casting. Here's how you did it in Python. Do this multiplication and, oh, by the way, convert it into an int so I can store it into y. Now, this language does not specifically require casting, but you can do it anyways. And there's three forms of casting. Most people don't use that Python syntax. Instead, they'll use the original C language syntax that looks like that. And it means, okay, multiply d times c, and no matter what the result is, go ahead and converse it, convert it into an int. And the reason you have to put that into your code is to tell the compiler, yeah, I know we're demoting the data and they're going to lose data, but I'm smart enough to, that's really what I meant to do. So just do it without complaining. And it does, right? It would multiply D times C, get 13.5 or whatever it is, and then it would round it down to store into an int. So that's what's known as casting. Casting is providing a data type to tell the compiler it's okay to demote the data. So spe specifically, it just converts it from one numeric form to another. So you could do x is equal to i and t y, that would cast y to an int, or you could do that, or there's the third syntax, which is actually the preferred one. And it's nasty looking. 
And if you want to know why you are supposed to use that one, I'll let you Google up. Just Google up why you use static cast. Even though you're supposed to do it, I'll usually do it like that, just because that's the way that I learned from the C language, you know, the 1970s style. No, I didn't learn programming in the 70s, but, you know, I learned the C language first, and that's the syntax that it used. Then this was introduced in early versions of C++, and then this was introduced in an update to C++, and it's considered the best. All three of these will take Y and convert it, convert the bits to be stored in a format of an int. So promotion is always safe. You can always promote the data. But if you demote the data, you get data overflow. You get corrupted data. And I'll show you what I mean. Let's go back into our code and type in a really large number. Long, long L, I use an L so it doesn't look like a one, is equal to, and I'm gonna type in a number that's larger than an int. An int can go to two billion. Well, let's make this nine billion. And a billion is a number with nine zeros. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, semicolon, like that. And now we're gonna store that in an int. Int i equals, and I need to convert it. Now the C language is loosey goosey and it would do the conversion anyways. So I don't even need to cast it. It might give me a warning. It's nice if it gives me a warning, but it might not. Now let's send that to the output. I equals in quote less and less than I less and less than the end deal. Well, it's certainly not going to equal 9 billion because that's just simply too large to fit into an int. Let's see what it looks like. The number's too large. It made it like four, I don't know how many zeros that is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 410 million is what it thinks that number is. Why does it think that? It's just a result of doing the conversion. You know, I'm there, there's an absolutely fix. That's what it would always give you, but I could not predict it in advance, right? It's just a result of it. And we've corrupted our data. That's called overflow. Let me give you another example of overflow. When a number gets too large. Now to do that, I'm going to use a loop. We haven't talked about loops, but you know what a loop is. I'm going to start a counter at one. Int count is equal to one, and I'm going to type this. While count is less than or equal to 20. Let's uh, also create a variable whose value is going to double each time. So int value is equal to one. And then while the counter is less than or equal to 20, we're going to see out the value. And then we're going to double it. So value times equals two. And then we're going to add one to the counter so that the counter keeps counting, right? Counter plus plus. Heck, why don't we print out the counter as well, right? So C out less than count, less than less than a space, quote, space, quote, less than less than the value. All right, there we go. Here it goes merrily counting. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, so on, so on, so on. Nicely doubled and it gets up to 500,000. Great. It never exceeded the maximum capacity of an int. Now, thinking back to our lecture, what is the maximum value for a number that can be stored in 32 bits? 2 to the power of 32. So I bet I could double a number 32 times and it still would not get corrupted. That may not be strictly true because of that sign bit, meaning whether it's positive or negative, the very first bit of it dictates whether it's a negative number. 
So we might only be able to double it 31 times before. But let's run it and see. Where's my output? There he is. Right? Yeah, it doubled it 31 times. And then on the 32nd time, it got corrupted. What if I made it an unsigned int? It might be able to go that second time. So unsigned int. Let's give it a shot. It did successfully double it 32 times. But if we make it double it one more time, the data is going to get corrupted. We're going to have overflow. So if I keep say keep going and do a 33rd doubling. going to crash. All right. So we're going to use a larger data type. Let's use a long, long rather than an int. So rather than an unsigned int, I'm going to use an unsigned long, long. Just so I get every single bit worth of data out of it. There's no sign bit be occupying the first bit of that number. All right. 33 times didn't hurt. Well, a long, long is an eight byte data type. Eight times eight is 64. We ought to be able to double it 64 times before it gets corrupted. So I'm gonna choose 65 just because I wanna see the corruption actually happen. It doubled it the 65th time and it got set down to zero. Normally what you'll see when you're not using unsigned is it'll go negative. Once a number gets too large, it flips over to being negative, which sounds weird. But there it goes, right? So the 64th time it went negative, and then it got set to zero. Uh, anyways, this is a point where the overflow happened. Data got too large to store it. Why did I go off on that tangent? Because we were talking about the hierarchy of types. You can store large, much larger numbers into a long. How about if we made it a double? How many times would we have to multiply it before we saw it get corrupted? Well, it's certainly not just going to be 64, 65 times. Because the exponent can get like to 308 or something before it corrupts. So let's just make it go up to 400. Double our number 400 times. Nope. Do it a thousand times. You can see that these numbers are far, far, far larger than an integer type can handle. Nope, but we're getting there. I expect that if I make it a 1,100, that that'll do the trick. So 1100. And it went after 1000 and 24 times, which is also an, a multiple of two. If two to the two to the power of eight is 256, two to the power of nine is 512, two to the power of 10 is 1024. I don't know where I'm going with that, but it definitely is a power of two. And then when it did it one more time, the data got corrupted and it got set to a special value that when we try to print it out, C displayed it as INF. 
I wonder what that really is. Wonder what that really means. So why don't we print that value out, cast back to a long, right? So C out, long, let's cast it, long, long, int. You don't have to type the word int, you can just call it a long, long of the value. Just because I wonder what that INF looks like when it's turned back into an integer. If I close this window and then zoom it again, it'll be done because displaying data is really slow. There, see, it's already done. All right, so apparently it treats that special value as being INF or something like that. I don't know how it calculates what INF is standing for infinity. Data overflow. Anytime you demote data, you can get overflow. Normally the demotion doesn't happen unless the variable that you're storing the result in is smaller of a lesser type than what the expression calculated. And like I said, some languages force you to use a cast in order to get that to work. In those languages, I would have to do that. I would have to force the demotion to get the compiler to work. Is it, does it even show that as a warning? If I look at my error list, do I see a warning? Let's find out. View the error list, one warning. Conversion from int 64, meaning a 64-bit integer, to an int possible loss of data. So good, at least it told me. And if I uh, put that there, it'll get rid of that warning. So when I rebuild it, it's no longer gonna be in the error list. I am taking responsibility for that. All right, we're getting to the point where I've lost my voice from the three lectures today, and I guess we've gone two hours. I'd like to go a little bit further, but I'm not sure how much further. Let's take a look. Type coercion, automatic conversion of an operand to another data type. Conversion to a higher type is always safe. Conversion to a lower type is not. Coercion rules. Characters, shorts, unsigned shorts, they all go up to an int. When operating on values of different data types, the lower one gets promoted to the type of the higher one. But when you use the equal sign, the type on the expression on the right will be converted to the variable on the left. Overflow and underflow. We've talked about that. Overflow occurs when assigning a value that is too large or too small. If we've been making it a negative number, you can still get overflow, but then you call it underflow, right? If you had a negative number getting larger and larger and larger, then it's called wrapping around. Let's see if we can give an example of wrap around. I'm gonna comment out this loop because we've proven the point. So although I normally wouldn't do this, I'm gonna use a character to store a number. So I'm gonna use a lot of casting in this example. So there's my character. Character CH is equal to one. Let's do the same kind of thing. Our counter is equal to 250 or 260. If you're typing this code in as I did, you would get an error when you typed int count because it was already defined unless you commented it out like I did. So I guess I could just change the variable name to counter. All right, while the counter is greater than zero, I'm just rephrasing this a little bit. This time we're gonna count down. I don't know why I'm doing it like that. Let's set the counter equal to one or zero and then keep going while the counter is less than 260. What are we gonna do this time? We're gonna print out the counter 
and then followed by a space, followed by the value of the character, followed by ENDL, but I want it to be represented as a number. So I'm going to convert it to an int. And then I'm gonna increment the counter by one. And it's gonna repeat that 260 times. Now, the thing that I'm curious about is that a character is an 8-bit data type, unless we uh, compile it in a special way to make it support Unicode, multi-byte character sets. And so the largest value it can carry is all ones, which is 255. But since we're going to be casting it to an int, we don't even have all those bits. A int can hold values that are negative to positive, I'm gonna be curious what this does. Let's see what this does. Once it reaches 256, the data is gonna be messed up. No, it's not, what did I do wrong? I forgot to add one to CH as well. Right, because we're, we're, we wanna see the value of character of CH increase. Try that again. All right, and there at a, after a certain point, it went negative. The maximum value that it could hold, the largest value, is a 127. Now, why is that? Because when we're talking about signed values, values that can go positive and negative, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, the first bit controls whether it's positive or negative. This first bit, if it's not set, if it's set to zero, it means it's a positive number. But if it is set, then it means it's a negative number. And so if we max it out with as many, with seven ones, that's the largest positive number we can get. Because as soon as we add one more to it, it becomes that. And it says, oh, we're now a negative number. And there's no such thing as negative zero. So they use something called two's complement to convert this to a number. And via two's complement, one followed by all that many zeros is equal to negative 128. And then if we had one zero 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 one, that's a 127. This is a negative 128. And this is a negative 127, and it starts counting its way back up. I don't remember if on the first day or so I mentioned the Pac-Man two, level 256 error. But if you're playing Pac-Man and you get past level 255, <laughs> Level 255 is the largest level that Pac-Man can support. And once it hits negative, once it adds one to it, that unsigned integer flips to being a negative. And so it can't draw it anymore. It doesn't know how to draw a level with a negative number in it. And so you get this absurd looking screen. <laughs> It's just a programming bug, but the uh, guy who programmed Pac-Man never thought anybody would be able to play for 256 screens. The idea is ridiculous, but of course people finally got good enough to do it. So that's data overflow in action. So other classic video games like Donkey Kong had similar problems. In Donkey Kong, you could get to a level where your character would die the second the screen began. So obviously you can't keep playing and so on. So when you get wraparound, what can happen? Some systems might display a warning message or an error message or stop the program. Our systems aren't gonna stop the program, they're gonna continuing execution using the incorrect value as though there was nothing wrong. But there is something wrong. So it's up to us to detect data overflow or to try to program defensively so it can't happen. And that's about enough of that. Well, typecasting. We talked about this already, so we may as well get credit for it by looking at this. Use typecasting for manual conversion, like this. 
whatever the result of this number is, I want you to turn it into a double using a static cast. <coughs> there are several different styles. There's the old fashioned C style cast that I tend to use. One reason I use this is, is how Java does it as well. Parentheses, INT, in parentheses, or whatever the data type is, could be double or long, long or whatever, followed by the data. And then there's the pre-standard C++, meaning old fashioned C++, they do it in the Python syntax. INT parentheses or float parentheses or whatever. Both are still supported in C++, but static underscore cast is preferred. Just a little thought exercise, Google up why is static underscore cast preferred. And we are done for the day. I'm not gonna give you homework because I want you to have done the chapter, I want you to do the chapter two quiz. Plus there's two more things I want you to do. Let me go to Canvas and show you. I think I have to unlock the quizzes before you can do them. You go, oh man, more quizzes? Not really. Let me show you what they are. Oh, here they are, okay. Crash course in computer science. These, this is a series of videos. It's like 20 or 25 episodes long. Each one is pretty short. I want you to watch episodes three and four. You can watch the first two if you want, but at least watch three and four. And they're kind of interesting, at least I hope you think so. 10 minutes long. Hi, I'm Carrie Ann, and welcome to Crash Course Computer Science. Single boom was flowing out. And she goes and talks about. She goes and talks, you know, about the various concepts. So what I want you to do is to watch it, and then to actually take the quiz over it. Oh no, I have to take a quiz over it. Now all the quiz is something that says yes, I watched it. and then to fill in something that you learned from it, right? Did you watch the video? Yes, I did. Did you get something from it? If so, explain in a sentence or two, right? So you're gonna get full credit just for having watched it, right? You're gonna get 10 points out of 10 just for clicking through. But I do want you to type in something here, even if, nah, I really already knew all this, right? But if you leave it blank, I am gonna lower your grade on the quiz, because that's not fair for the people who are actually gonna type stuff in. All right. So you got two of those, and then you have your regular quiz. So let me set the due dates appropriately for this, and that'll be your homework. Make sense, gang? Let's go ahead and stop here. You don't wanna hear me go hoarse. I think we've lectured long enough. We would only really go for another 15 or 20 minutes anyways, and I think we've made a lot of progress. So are there any questions? Go ahead and chat them in or whatever while I change the due dates. There should be a Dropbox ready so that when you feel like writing in the uh, lecture review form, you should be able to do so. All righty, gang. If you have any questions over the programming over the weekend or whatever, please text me and I'll see y'all on Monday.